Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have Forrest Hecker here with us tonight. He is the new Florida Friendly Landscaping Programs Community Outreach Specialist for the Sarasota County's UF IFAS Extension and Sustainability, a graduate of the University of South Florida, and he's also a native of Southwest Florida. Forrest comes from a whole family of environmentalists. Today, Forrest will talk about attracting wildlife, which is the fifth principle of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. He will cover plants with seeds, fruit, foliage, flowers, or berries that provide food. He will also cover the importance of having sources of water. So Forrest, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are ready for you. Oh, we got you on mute, on mute Forrest. Good evening, everyone. Let me just set up the screen sharing really quick. All right, so. Actually, let me restart this, sorry. Okay, this is not working like it did when we just started. All right, so do, do you guys see the PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay, and is it full screen? Yes. Okay, it's from my side, it's not turned full screen. So it was making me get all messed up. Okay, so good evening, everyone. So I was um, going over planning for backyard wildlife in Sarasota County, and this is the fifth principle in Florida friendly landscaping. So my name is Forrest Hecker, and I'm the new Sarasota County Florida Friendly Landscaping Specialist as of roughly a month ago. And if you haven't visited our offices, offices it's a great campus. It's um, at Twin Lakes Park in the Green Building. So the address is right there. And if you would like to contact me for any reason, my office phone number is listed as well as my email. And this slide will be at the end of the presentation too. So as I stated previously, there's nine principles for Florida friendly landscaping. The number one principle is putting the right plant in the right place. The second is using water efficiently. The third is fertilizing appropriately. The fourth is magical mulch. It's a great tool to use. The fifth principle is the one that we're going over today and that's to planting plants that will attract wildlife. The sixth is managing yard pests and doing it responsibly. The seventh is recycling yard debris and other things inside your um, yard. The eighth is reducing stormwater runoff and nine is protecting the waterfront, which is very important here in Southwest Florida. So the um, first thing we're going to cover is it's really important to create habitats and you can do that in your backyard. So urban areas are rapidly increasing and the decisions you make as a resident of Southwest Florida can create a big difference because right now there's um, biological deserts of just grass and um, plants that don't provide any biological value to the ecosystem. So the basics of creating a wildlife habitat is you wanna limit the amount of the lawn. It's fine if you have some, but just make sure that um, it's just not a desert of lawn. So 
You want to plant a variety of flowering and fruiting plants, and you want to use plants of varying height to create layers for shelter, and that will attract uh, wildlife, having different layers like a canopy, understory, ground cover, etc. So these diverse areas attract wider varieties of animals. So when creating a habitat, you want to look at um, providing food, water, shelter, and the space for whatever you're trying to attract. So animals only really reside and forage in, and reside and forage in areas with appropriate habitats. So as I stated previously, it's really important to do the uh, vertical layers. You want to take into account how the seasonally the some leaves might be deciduous, some might be evergreen. You want to leave brush piles. They're a great tool, especially for insects and uh, little critters, snags. Everyone loves to cut them down, but if it's in a safe spot away from your house, you should leave it standing. At, I mean, you might have an arborist come out and make sure that it's structurally sound, but they provide a great uh, place for insects, woodpeckers, and other things. So as I sta stated, when trees die, they become what we call snags, and they're great for woodpeckers. They're also great for nesting. Um, I just the other day, I saw a caracara using a, a snag, and <laughs> it, it's in those natural areas like Mayaka River, there you can really see the value that these snags provide. So something that you might want to consider putting in is um, adding birdhouses, bat houses, and things for pollinators. So personally, I think we need way more bat houses. As you know, um, bats are under a lot of pressure due to um, factors that humans have caused. So. When you're um, planting for wildlife, it's really important to consider the pollinators. And when you do this, think about uh, having three or more plants that bloom each season. You don't want a monoculture. Like personally, I love firebush, but sometimes I realize I'm overdoing it. I'm planting too many because um, having a variety of different things will attract different pollinators and seasonally allow different uh, pollinators to stick around. So it's really good to plant nectar and host plants for butterflies. Um, it's a great idea to provide places for bees to nest. And I'm not talking about honeybees. I'm talking more about the native bees. And a lot of those are solitary. They just pr uh, providing them um, some reeds or something, grasses to nest in is great. And avoid using pesticides when possible. Try using an integrated pesticide management approach, and that includes using biological controls like ladybugs and green lacewings. So personally, I think this is one of the most valuable things you can do, and that's providing water. As you know, right now it's the dry season. If you know, even the big water bodies are drying up. If you um, out there in the natural areas. So providing just a small fresh water source. And if you can hook up like a tiny uh, pump to make it run and like provide the cascading effects or something like that, that will even increase it drastically from a path. So water is essential for all wildlife and you, you'll be amazed at the things that will come to a a good water source in your backyard. When you put, put in a bird bath, you want to keep the water clean. And so when you have a chance, just take it, dump it out, put it, give it to the plants and just refill it. Because if it just fills up with algae and bird, uh, wildlife can't access it, it's not doing much. And get a bird bath with a textured bottom because then birds will actually use it for use taking baths. It will be more natural to them. So this is a big one for me. Uh, manage pets. 
Um, cats are responsible for killing hundreds of millions of birds in the United States yearly. And um, they're, they're a big problem. Like in my parents' neighborhood, they feed them. And you would think that would um, make them kill less birds, but they're still killing birds. And you should just avoid feeding them, seeing if you can get a no-kill shelter to trap them. And do your part, don't release exotic pets into the wild. So Florida is, like most areas, has a lot of invasive exotic species. We're in a subtropical climate, so we get a lot of plants, love it here. And 1.7 million acres of Florida's natural areas have been invaded by exotic plant species, such as Melaleuca, Brazilian pepper, and other invasive exotics. And invasive pest plants really destroy natural habitat by creating monocultures that just stifle out the native plants and make it um, really hard for our native species to survive. And if you've ever been to a a Brazilian pepper thicket, like it's great for migratory birds, and that's how it spreads so much is because birds love those berries, but nothing else can really survive in that um, area where it's just acres and acres of Brazilian pepper. So whatever you plant in your yard, you want to make sure it's not an invasive exotic because it will spread and it will impact areas far beyond your backyard. So a great way to do this is consider native vegetation. Native plants provide reliable sources of food and nectar, so planting them in your backyard will attract native wildlife. So you wanna remember the first principle, which is the right plant in the right place. And there's a lot of native plants that you can put in your yard and it'll be the right plant in the right place. So, but there is one disclaimer I want to say is that Florida friendly landscaping approved plants can be non native. So, if you only want to be in a uh, plant native plants, remember that, that uh, there are exotics that are considered Florida friendly. So, this is my favorite weed. I imagine it's a lot of people's favorite weed. That's Biden's Alba, Spanish needle. It's amazing for pollinators. And a lot of people consider it a weed, they're always pulling it up. And it's a weed is simply a plant that is growing in an unwanted area. If you allow Bi Biden's alba to grow and a little patch or something, you'll see how many pollinators use this plant. It's incredible. And if you the it, native plants have min, many benefits and a lot of them are considered weeds but if you let a little patch of these weeds survive you'll be amazed so uh, native vegetation there's some really amazing beautiful wild plants that are call florida home so there's our state flower coreopsis Blanket flower is a great one. Mine's doing amazing right now. Um, pokeweed, a lot of people will pull this up because it's poisonous to humans, but it's a great uh, source. It has a pretty cool flowers, has really cool stems, and the berries um, are just loved by birds. And I don't, I'm not too familiar with horse mint, but it's another native that you might want to look into for planting for wildlife. So when you're managing pests, you want to reduce your pesticide use and that will have a big effect on um, your planting for wildlife because if you use too many pesticides, you'll kill all the insects and it will just go up the food chain and things will leave your yard in mass. So use an integrated pest management system. If there's too many aphids, get some lady uh, beetles or some green lace wings. They're amazing. There's quite a few native ones here. And almost all wildlife species eat insects in some ways. So if you just wait around, 
and um, know that there is something in the area that feasts on the pests that you have, it will likely happen. You'll be attracting whatever wildlife that is into your yard to eat that pest. So another thing you want to be, uh, if you're planning for wildlife, be prepared for unwanted wildlife and just realize that um, why the animals are present because you're planning for backyard wildlife. Practice tolerance. Um, just three days ago, I caught a, a scarlet snake and honestly, I didn't, I knew it wasn't a coral snake, but I thought it was a scarlet king snake. And I had no idea really that there was a third mimic of or of the coral snake, and that's the scarlet snake. And it was pretty cool. And it's a really small snake, and a lot of people would just kill it. So, so just educate yourself on the different unwanted wildlife that can exist and practice tolerance and don't kill things just because you don't want them in your yard try relocating it, relocating them if possible. So another thing you want to do if you're planning for backyard wildlife is try to recruit your neighbors into expanding um, the scale of the habitat you provide. Because if you're an island in just a desert of St. Augustine, you're not, you're going to be cut off from the greater ecosystem and you won't be attracting as much as you could. So if you recruit a couple of neighbors to all plant pollination, pollinator plants, all plant trees that provide biological diversity, you'll create a larger ecosystem and you can even create wildlife corridors. I included a picture of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And as you can see, um, Sarasota County is pretty decent, but Manatee and Hillsboro, we definitely need to work on creating better corridors for wildlife through that segment of the state. So when you're providing food for wildlife, you really want to plant a variety of plants, as I stated earlier. You want to provide food all year, especially during the winter. And uh, a great way to attract wildlife, I do it, is uh, put bird feeders in, put salt blocks in, put, um, create nutrient-rich areas. I know it's unnatural, but that will really provide migrating wildlife and um, wildlife in general, just the chance to stick around and recuperate and, and get established in your area. So select plants with seeds, fruits, and flowers for food. And just be prepared that if you're planting something that's really pretty, like, um, like some of the milkweeds, be prepared for when the martyr comes and eat the monarch caterpillars come and eats it down to the ground. And while it might seem in the short term like you're losing a lot of beauty, then you're gonna have the beautiful butterflies flying around your yard. So um, native plants are preferred when you're doing this because the native wildlife is used to these plants and they do prefer them. So these are some plants that I selected that do really well in the Sarasota area and I thought were interesting and um, provide a lot of wildlife benefits. So sea grape is a great plant. It's, um, it has really fragrant white flowers that bloom in the spring. It has these sea grape, like grapes that you can actually use as human. They're edible and people make really cool jams and that sort of things from them. There is actually even a new chanterelle mushroom that was discovered. Um, I'm not allowed to say if to recommend it and I haven't tried it, but it's in that really um, gourmet mushroom category of chanterelles. And it's called the flamingo chanterelle. So if you wanna Google it, it's pretty colorful and pretty interesting. So sea grape attracts a lot of butterflies and birds. It's a great thing to plant in the yard for like hedges. This is a great plant. I personally love beautyberry. It, um, it, once you get one in your yard, more will pop up, but it provides tons of flowers and during the spring, and then it has these amazing 
um, berries, as you see pictured. I've seen people turn this into je make jelly out of it, and it was pretty interesting looking. And birds also love these berries. Oops. Okay, the marlberry is the next plant I was gonna go over. It's a large shrub, so it's, it gets pretty tall, 10 to 20 feet. It has fragrant white flowers that bloom all year. As you'll see, some of these plants bloom just in the spring, some of them bloom all year. So providing some uh, plants that bloom all year will be great for your pollinators. It's attractive foliage and the purple fruits provide food for wildlife and birds in the fall and winter. So this is one of my favorite plants. It's our uh, native wild coffee. There's actually two native wild coffees in this area. Um, it's a smaller shrub, so they can just be like a four or five feet tall. They're a great understory plant, as I said earlier. You want to provide different layers, so a canopy layer, understory, ground cover if possible. So this is a great plant to plant under trees because it likes it's tolerant and full shade. It has, Forest, I actually muted you by accident in my process of muting another. Can you unmute, please, and continue talking about the wonderful wild coffee? Oops, sorry about that. No uh, problem. Um, so as I was saying, uh, wild coffee has really nice white flowers, that, um, and it blooms through the summertime. It's pretty drought tolerant. From what I've seen, you might need to water it, but the best value in it is that it's great for being in like a full shade area. So you want to have different layers to your ecosystem. So canopy, understory, ground cover if possible. So this is a great understory plant. You can put it right under a big oak or something and it will thrive. So, and it attracts birds for its berries and I've heard people use this personally to make a coffee thing, but I don't believe it contains caffeine. So not as appealing to me. So here's one that um, is great for butterflies, but you have to be careful with. So porterweed, there's many different uh, varieties of porterweed now, hybrids, all the, there's quite a few different ones. So you want to get yours from a, a reputable native plant nursery because there are very invasive porterweeds. And as I said, it's one of the like plants I consider a butterfly plant because it will attract butterflies year round and they just love this nectar source. So here's my favorite one, firebush. So um, this one, if you've ever been to the university I went to, the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, they have some that are like 20 feet tall. And I probably spent a year walking under it and I didn't realize it was a firebush. I knew what a firebush was. I had seen them all the time, but I was used to them like in my grandparents' yard where they freeze to the ground almost every other year but in really coastal really warm areas they can turn into a tree and these the ones at the University of South Florida St. Petersburg they have trimmed to look like trees so it's quite cool to see them at that size like 20 15 20 feet tall like a tree and as I said that these are amazing for butterflies hummingbirds love them Right here at Twin Lakes, we have a couple of hummingbirds that have been hanging around, and that that is what they go to is firebush. So I know a lot of people want to get hummingbirds in the yard, so this is where you get a plant. But as I said, it dies back in a freeze. So if you are inland, be prepared for it to die all the way down. But it's really hardy; it always seems to bounce back. It will definitely be more. Um, bushier with a lot of different stems when it does die back, but 
you have to take what you get when you're in the place that's uh, colder. And this is something that I actually learned from this PowerPoint. I didn't know that the sphinx moth, sphinx moth went to the firebush as a host plant. And I personally love sphinx moth and I just planted a coral honeysuckle because I want to get those clear wing hummingbird moths in my garden. So here's a plant that I really like, and that's Kunti. So this is, um, I it's a, considered a shrub, but I wouldn't even consider that it that. It's only one to, one to three or four feet tall from what I've seen. It doesn't really, it doesn't have a stem. It's a tuber that shoots up leaves. It's um, great here in Sarasota. It's been used a lot in medians. A little cool story about it is that this plant was used for flower. It's actually, it's poisonous, so you don't want to try this at home, but there's a certain way of processing it and boiling it down to uh, make it edible to humans. And back around World War II, they wiped this plant off of Florida pretty much completely, harvesting it for flower. And when that happened, there was this beautiful little butterfly that you see right here. It's called the Tala hair streak butterfly. And this butterfly went extinct on mainland Florida. And it only um, survived. It, it does have populations in the Bahamas, but the only place it survived in Florida was in um, a little barrier island that wasn't inhabited by people that was uh, off Miami, off Key Biscayne. So now this butterfly is having a comeback. I personally recommend going to Miami Beach Botanical Garden. You'll be amazed by how many of these Otala butterflies are there. People are spreading them around the state and trying to get them reestablished into their native range. There's historical documentation of them being in Southwest Florida all the way up to Pinellas. And uh, there's a little pocket pile colonies that are started by people. These butterflies are pretty clumsy, small, they don't go far. So I think it's great people are spreading them around. And if you come out to our office at Twin Lakes Park, there are actually um, a talus here right now. Mysteriously, there's like 30 or at least 30. Here. So if you're <clears throat> interested in butterflies, you should come out and see the ones that are here. So this is another plant like porterweed that I would consider to be, um, you should be very careful on where you source it because Dutchman pipe vine, also called Aristolochia, can be invasive and there are invasive varieties and species of it. So make sure you get yours from a reputable native plants um, nursery. And this, has really unique flowers. Like, look at that flower and just tell me, if, have you ever seen a flower like that before? And the reason I love it is because it's the larval host to several swallowtail butterfly species, including the pipevine swallowtail. So you should plant it just for, if you love butter, butterflies, this is one of those things to plant because the swallowtail that does lay its eggs on it, it will lay a bunch together and those Caterpillars are all grouped up together. So like, like, there's something that you can see in your garden and see the benefit you're providing. Because some caterpillars you will never see. Like the, the hummingbird moth I was mentioning earlier, it looks like a hornworm. And I've had a coral honeysuckle before and I've had those moths, but I've never seen a caterpillar. So sometimes it's cool to plant uh, for things you see as you see the larval stage of it. So this next, uh, and now I'm getting into trees. So this is the wild tamarind. It's a native tree that gets 40, 50 feet tall. It is kind of cold sensitive. So you, as I said earlier, these cold sensitive plants, you wanna be closer to the coast or just like live in a place a few years, figure out your microbiome and your, your microclimate, I mean, <laughs> figure out your microclimate for your yard because it, it's right down the street, it might be like, there might be a super tropical tree, but at your house, 
it might freeze every year. Like it's crazy how drastically the microclimate can switch, uh, change around in Florida. So as this plant or this tree is great because it's um, a lot of sulfurs all go to the same type of trees and they all go, they use this as their larval host plant. And yeah, this is another hair streak, I believe. And I personally love the hair streak because a lot of people overlook all the little hair streak butterflies. So this one I wanted to include, it is a really tropical uh, native plant. And um, a lot of people, because a lot of the figs and ficuses are so invasive, they're like, oh, it's a fig or ficus, I got to kill it. But I, if one does pop up in your yard, I would um, double check and see if it's this one, because the short leaf fig is native to Florida. And I personally think it's pretty cool, all these strangler figs, are, like how they can take over a, um, a plant. So it, the, the figs also provide edible fruit for so much wildlife. So if you plant this, be prepared for the wildlife it attracts. And um, yeah, the, the fruits attract tons of birds. And I actually didn't know this was a larval host for many species of butterflies. I'm gonna have to look further into that. So th these are some good resources if you're looking to plant uh, native plants for backyard wildlife. And I, if you reach out to me by email, I can send you these resources. I can also provide you hard copies to, we have some amazing resources down here at the extension office if you've never been here. There's a lot of cool hard copies if you're into that of uh, books that are um, pretty cool. Let me see. This plant right here, it's about to get a be redone and add 150 new plants to it. But I, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design, it tells you if something's native or not. It tells you if it's the right plant in the right place in your yard. And I think it's a great resource to have. And we have those and we can I can send you the information to get your own copy. So if you do want to follow up with me, um, this is my phone number and my email. I actually can't see my chat from the way this is set up. So I'll have to end the presentation to see the chat and answer questions. But if you do want to reach out to me in the future, this is my office phone number and this is my email address. And if you want to see those Atala butterflies come out to the, um, Twin Lakes Park on Clark Road, because right now they are here. We have a butterfly garden and I saw like a dozen today. Does that finish the presentation? Yes, that was in presentation. So I, I had to end it to pull up the chat. Absolutely, no problem. Um, at this time, if you haven't asked a question, feel free to put that in the chat. We will go ahead and read some of those. Um, yeah, we have time, no problem. I, I went ahead and helped myself. I've asked quite a few questions. <laughs> um, so I'll just start from the top and we'll go down. Um, so first question started with, uh, will bat houses on standard size lots keep bats from nesting on a home? I am not an expert on bats. Yeah. Uh, providing an alternative house may, that's better than your house, if you already have them established, it might make a move out. I do not know though. Um, but I personally think if you garden at all, Get in a bat house established is great because they provide really nutrient rich uh, excrement. So if you put a compost heap or something under the bat house, you're going to have amazing soil for things. Um, and then I, as you were talking about the cats, I had posted this that uh, I re witnessed, I think it was three, three birds in two months, my cat got when we first had. Uh, we can't keep her pet and she's pretty much feral and um, 
we put this bird be safe collar on her and I don't know if you've seen it, but it really, really worked. I have not seen her since I put that on. I have not seen her get a, a cat, a, a bird. So I put that in the chat. Um, it's, there was a question about the bottom picture. It was on your providing for wildlife. What is the bottom picture? What does it contain? I think the birds were eating something in a... Uh, providing for wildlife? Mm -hmm. Providing food for wildlife? Yes. That looked to be um, just like a special, a specialized um, bird feeder. Let me see if I can pull that. So like. I think they were looking to see like, what was um, the, the suet, the suet bricks, it looks similar to that, except there's seeds inside. So it's just a specialized bird feeder. It's not a plant or anything. Okay. And then um, what was the purpose of the salt block? The salt block? Um, that would be more for like deer and um, larger mammals, but in providing like a source of salt, like it's a central nutrient for a lot mammals and for muscle function. So if you ha put it in, you'll probably see more deer and stuff if you live in a place that gets those larger oh. mammals. Okay. We had, how long does it take to get a fire bush to a tree? That was when you were <laughs> talking. It depends on if you freeze or not. Um, fire bush does grow really quickly as the ones that I planted a year and a half ago are already like five or six feet tall. So they do grow pretty quickly uh, to turn it into a tree five or more years if it doesn't freeze but um it is really cool when you see them trimmed like a tree where you can plant like wild coffee or something under it it's you can create that vertical gardening experience that canopy and understory that will attract different things at different times of the year Can Cerrado chapter members help establish those new Itala colonies in their yards? And if so, how many kuti would it take to start a new colony? Um, personally, it's, uh, I would say it depends on having a good nectar source with the Itala's uh, host plant, which is the kunti plant. And from, I would, it takes a lot um probably like 200 or more chrysalis but if you have been to Miami Beach Botanical Garden it is insane how many chrysalis they have and it's a little island and their head horticulturist um uh, she's yeah so like she's all into spreading the atalas around and they're they're not the even though they're really rare and they should be endangered, they're not protected in any way. Landscapers spray for them, unfortunately. So uh, it's great to spread them around. For, if you ever see them in a landscape that would likely be sprayed, I would collect them, move them to a more natural area. Any recommendations for urban habitats on rooftops or porches or areas where space would be extremely limited? Um, I'm trying to think um, how limited, as I said, there's, um, I would maybe look into like, if you have a railing, putting in like a really uh, good, the vine, I, I wouldn't probably put like any of the Ristolokia species, but maybe like curl honeysuckle uh, that's pretty it doesn't get out of control and you could it would provide some uh, biological benefit in urban habitat a lot of the hummingbirds are migratory they'll just be flying through an area and if you've ever like seen migratory birds when they're coming off a long a long um, flight over a water body or something they need to find food right away when they get to land because they want to stop and rest but then that can be the worst thing for them if you've ever seen one land on a boat or something they're not able to keep on going 
So like providing like a nectar source or something would be really good in my opinion. And uh, the butterfly garden at um, Twin Lakes is open 24 seven. It's not closed at all. So, so if somebody could just 24 seven, like it's, a, it's whatever the park hours are, but sunset or 10 p.m. I think it's probably 10 p.m. since there's lights. All right. Tom says, great program. Keep spreading the word. And Karen said, uh, did you introduce the Atalas? How did they get there? How many Kunti do you have? I'd love to get some at the Celery Field Nature Center. So um, the Atalas are like my side project I'm doing during my lunch breaks. And um, they did get here because I brought them here. but. And personally, like, I think it's borderline for them being right in this spot because um, they can tolerate a freeze, but it will definitely knock the population down. And if it's just getting started and we get a freeze like we did um, this last January, that would be devastating. They definitely are more coastal butterfly in this uh, part of the state. So the barrier islands would be great. Any place that's close to a large body of water. They, as I said, historically, they were uh, documented all the way up to Pinellas. There were historical documentation of it all the way up there. And um, I haven't been to celery fields in a while, but if you have um, the nectar, garden and which includes like I've seen them love this uh, native shrub tree called fiddlewood they love that it blooms year round it provides a great source for of nectar for its patellas at Miami Beach Botanical Garden and you honestly don't need too many kuntis because they don't demolish the kunti plant like the uh, monarchs demolish the regular tropical mugweed. All right, well, we do have Fiddlewood there as well as Kunti. So um, yeah, but we're a little inland, um, but, but we're surrounded by the, the water source that is the celery fields that mm -hmm. the County built that stormwater. So um, maybe in future as climate yeah. change <clears throat> um, I are freezing. Yeah. And if, um... My dad has like established like three or four colonies of Atalas and like the one thing I've noticed with them is say like, I would say like um, mangoes are like a good like indicator species of like how cold it gets and they kind of would have the same range of like mangoes and yeah just it probably takes around 200 300 chrysalis to get a pollen population going unfortunately it's been so windy I feel like they're getting blown around here but it, it's a bad time in April with how windy it is and these things are really clumsy because they're poisonous and they know things don't like eating them so they're not strong flyers even though they live on barrier islands so that's surprising well, and okay we have a comment here about audio I've gone ahead and tried to update the microphone so hopefully it's stronger um, Tom has a question. Florida friendly principle number nine states to protect our coastlines. Would you use this at the commission meet meeting? Plants rather than sea walls. That might be more for Karen. That was like a statement. That was a comment. Yes, they need but, to follow on the Florida friendly at the commission meeting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then it says 10 years from a volunteer seed for the native firebush. Okay, so I think that's regarding making it into a tree. Yeah. Um, and then does IFAS have a bat specialist to get further information, please? Um, there is a local agent who specializes in like natural resources and wildlife. Um, I would, I if you send me an email, I can get you in contact with her. And yeah, she might have more information on that. I think she she's talked about that before. Okay. And at the state office, of course, there's tons of specialists, and I can probably find someone that is into bats. And something that wasn't mentioned, but we had a little dialogue before the meeting, 
um, the regarding the vanilla. Would you mind sharing? I don't. I had no idea. Rachel sounds um, like she knew, but I had no idea. So uh, before the meeting, we were talking about different things, and uh, vanilla orchid is native to Florida. There's five species native to Florida. We actually have the pollinator that goes to it, which is the orchid bee, and um, it's, it's actually something UF Extension is pushing is vanilla as an agricultural crop because it grows great in our climate because it's native and uh, we have the pollinator so we don't need the labor um, that is required to grow in Madagascar. Like in Madagascar, they don't have this bee so they have to hand pollinate it and it, that's why it's so expensive. It's, it's so labor intensive. And the one thing I would say is, I'll, I, if you get in contact with me, I can try to keep you on the loop, but there is a specialist at um, IFAS who's all into vanilla and he's pushing that vanilla commercial agriculture incentive. And he's actually planning on doing a citizen science project and Sarasota County is one of the counties that's gonna be part of it. And so citizen science is when they recruit just random everyday people um, to take part in these scientific projects. And like the seagrass survey that's coming out, that's a citizen science project. So the citizen science project is all about vanilla. They're gonna ship you a vanilla plant and all you gotta do is uh, record like how well it grows, if it gets pollinated and that sort of things. And I, I can send you more information on that. I might be able to pull it up right now. <laughs> Christopher says the Selby Gardens has a 15 foot tall fire bush with a cor coral honeysuckle vine growing on it, plus a wildflower garden planted under it. Sounds like a dream come true, Forrest. <laughs> yep, they, that's that vertical gardening where you're creating a canopy understory, adding a vine in there. That's great. Yeah. And then Tom has, uh, do you or could you preset this program to any schools? I think young people would also find this program interesting. Um, I'm relatively new to the job, so I I'm still learning everything that is required. I do know like I'm helping out with the school program, but it's more, it's less gardening centric and more uh, like Florida. If you've ever heard of Florida Master Naturalist Program, um, one of the agents here has created that for kids. So the kids get to go out to the three different modules of the Florida Master Naturalist Program. So they get to go to uplands, freshwater systems and a coastal field trip. And it's really cool, but um, I hope to talk to her and collaborate with her about how these kids can learn about planting Florida-friendly plants and native plants in their yards. Beautiful. Well, that looks like that's all of the questions. Um, wonderful presentation. Thank you for all the information. And I look forward to hearing more about that uh, link to the vanilla and Looks like we have. I'm gonna pop a couple links in there from. Okay. Find it, but um. And then there was also. So and if you have any more questions, please follow up by email. This is my first month on the job, but uh, I see my predecessor here in this chat, so hopefully I've lived up to um, your expectations. And I'm, this is a great program, and I'm excited to be here. Oh. <laughs> That's wonderful. Somebody said, thanks, Forrest. Nice to meet you. That's from Catherine Oliver. All nice right, to well, meet you. Yeah, thank you very much for your time and for all your share sharing. And uh, just a reminder again, guys, we have that plant sale. So hopefully we'll see some faces in person uh, coming up this Saturday. And there is no limit to the attendees. So, um, so I guess that's it for today. All right, guys, have a wonderful night and thank you for being with us.